This is a, an interview with Stephen Dennis, New York State Military Museum, Saratoga Springs, New York, uh, the 10th of April, 2003, approximately 1.45 p.m. The interviewers are Mike Russert and Wayne Clark. Uh, could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? Um, uh, my name is Stephen Dennis. I was born uh, uh, August the 9th, 1922, in the, in the town of Stillwater. Okay. Um, where did you go to school? What was your educational background prior to entering the military? I was, uh, uh, I practically graduated from high school. I dropped out of school when my brother dropped dead. Oh. I never went back to school. He was in college. I was supposed to go to college. I never went to college because he dropped dead and uh, uh, there was nobody to help me, uh, show me the way. In fact, when I got back, I went to uh, uh, the principal at a high school and uh, after I got out of the service, I wanted to go to college. He said I had to come back to the high school for a year before I went to go to college, and I wouldn't do it. Mm -hmm. And I think he lied to me because, not lied, but he didn't tell me the truth, but uh, because uh, I could have went to college on just taking the exam, the entrance exam. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I found that out way too late. Mm -hmm. Where were you, and what do you remember when you heard about Pearl Harbor? I was working. We were working. I was working in a paper mill. I was an apprentice electrician. And uh, when it happened, uh, uh, right away we all got excited and we wanted to go join up. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, we were asking the boss for a raise. He wouldn't give us a raise, so we quit. So we went down, me and a friend of mine that worked in the same department, went down, we went down and we joined up in the 12th of December, we're sworn in and gone to Newport, Rhode Island. Now, how old were you when you enlisted? 19. I just turned 19. 19 okay. Um, where did you go for your training? Newport, Rhode Newport. Island. Newport. Newport, Rhode Island. Where all your training was yeah, in Newport? All, I know training. Mm -hmm. 20 well, days of getting shots. 20 days of getting shots. That's all. Mm -hmm. They issued us a rifle and I never used it. All we did is stay there, and the only reason we were there that long we to get the shots. Twenty, I think the 28th or 29th of December, we are on a ship already. The ship was commissioned at Christmas time uh, by Margaret Mitchell, and uh, we were already on a ship. What ship was that? The USS Atlanta. Yeah, okay, yeah. so that was your first ship. Yeah. Um, uh, were you there for the christening? No, no, we got there right after, mm -hmm. right, at, right after the... Uh, Right after they got done, we start moving in, all, all of us start moving so in. So basically all your training was on the ship. On the ship, itself. yeah. Could you tell us about about that, your experiences? Well, one one thing one thing when we went, went out to sea, no, none of us ever been out to sea or anything else. Why did you pick the Navy? Uh, because I couldn't get in the Army. They, they, they wouldn't take me in the, in a draft. They said, they said uh, I don't know what they said about it, but they wouldn't take me. I tried to get, volunteer for a draft. They wouldn't take me. Mm -hmm. So we went down and joined the Navy, and they took us. Mm -hmm. So you'd never been in a real a, a big ship or no, anything? No, no. I'd never, never been hardly anywhere. Mm -hmm. best I ever was was in a CC camp down in Yapbank, Long Island. That's the furthest I've been away from the house, mm -hmm. see, until that time. Mm -hmm. So... So what was it like being trained on a ship at sea? Oh, hey, it was nice. It was nice. I really enjoyed it because I've been away. Uh, uh, I haven't been a homebody, you know. I was always out hustling on my own and everything else. And uh, these, here, these here people, when you went down, when you went on a ship, like my grandson said now, Grandpa, I never knew I knew so much. He said, when I got on the ship, he says, uh, nobody knows anything. Well, we were that way when we were on our ship. We didn't know anything, and we had a we had a crew. The basic crew was all the officers and, and the uh, petty officers, and they pretty well knew what they were doing. And what well, well, mostly we did was uh, uh, get our guns, start training our, our guns, what we had to do, and then. Most, and then we uh, regular seamen do the regular seamen work around around and uh, every time we go to start training we, we had to go to our same post and how to get there and how quick we had to get there and everything else so yeah, we did we did pretty good we trained uh, we even went through the Cape Cod Canal oh. way back in January I guess of 42 we went through the Cape Cod Canal 
Now, what kind of ship was the Atlanta? Uh, beautiful cruiser. Beautiful. It was a cruiser. cruiser. Oh, beautiful. Uh -huh. It was a. Here she is. Here you can. Here you can is. hold this up and. Uh, Here she is. Here's the Atlanta. So where where were you stationed on the ship? Upper handling room, mm -hmm. which is right on the water line below the turret. Mm -hmm. okay. We got the got. Okay. We got it. Now, what what was your uh, what specific things did you do there? I took the powder out of the can and sent the powder up. The powder come in the can. You had to take one turn off and take it out of the can, and then you threw the can out and out into the kitchen. See. Mm -hmm. Out into a mess hall, not kitchen mm -hmm. mess hall. See. Then what happened to the can after that? Uh, well, after after everything was all over, we go pick them up. Mm -hmm. See. But uh, before that, we had to get them right out there because we didn't have no room in where we were. See, we couldn't put them anywhere in there. Mm -hmm. And uh, as the tour needed them, we just sent them right up to them. How did they get up there? A, a little elevator. Mm -hmm. Like a little elevator went right right up. We just shove them right in the elevator, and they take them as they want to. Mm -hmm. Now, the powder, was the powder in, like, cloth bags or something? Yeah, or they're, it yeah they're, they're in bags. We took them out of the cans. Okay. See, and they put them in bags, and they... I guess they, they blew right out when they when they mm -hmm. when they shot. Mm -hmm. Was it pretty noisy down there? Uh, uh, no, it wasn't wasn't that bad down there. It wasn't that bad. The biggest thing is very boring. You're locked in. You couldn't go out. You couldn't know what's going on. You didn't know what time, practically what time it was, or anything else. Where where you where where are you? We didn't even know where we were. Mm -hmm. And when you don't know where you are, you you start th thinking. Say, hey, a lot of guys get scared and say. I know some some guys real were worry warts, you know, they'd never been away from home. They really were scared. Mm -hmm. But hey, it wasn't that bad, and it wasn't bad until somebody died. Mm -hmm. When you see somebody die, then it's a completely different story. Mm -hmm. Until then, it was fun shooting at the Japs all the time. And uh, when we got our, our, we were artillery for the Marines when we invaded Guadalcanal, after we got out of the Battle of Midway, I no, think, why don't you tell us about the Battle of Midway? Oh, Battle of Midway, we didn't fire a shot. Mm -hmm. we're, we're the carrier Hornet. They didn't even know we were there. They thought the other three carriers were there, see? Mm -hmm. And, uh, the, and uh, we're with the Hornet, and we're with Torpedo Squadron 9. We're one of the few ships that were able to pick up the, pick up the uh, uh, pilots if they landed and catch up to the ships without them slowing down, see? Mm -hmm. So not, none of them ever come back. So all we did is just hug the Hornet and in case anybody come, we're 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 AA cruiser, what they called an AA cruiser. What does we, that mean? We had three turrets in front, three turrets in back, and all guns on the side. Everything else were protection for air, uh, any kind of a ship that we we went against. Mm -hmm. That was our big gun, is the five inch. See, and they had timers on the end. They could. Plane was so high the computer could get a hold, <clears throat> get a hold of it, and it, they'd set the timing on it automatically, and it exploded a certain height in the air. See, mm -hmm. so it's always a different height, no matter where you're shooting. Mm -hmm. See, so the. Did you ever work on uh, other guns besides being down in the powder room? Yeah, I was down. <laughs> I was on a what they call a pom pom gun, a 1.1, mm -hmm. and uh, them things here uh, they got so sensitive on the end that uh, a raindrop would explode the shell, see? Mm -hmm. So uh, we, normally we're always blowing up the end of a, end of a barrel, see? So uh, uh, it didn't last too long. I didn't stay there too long for some reason. I don't know why. You don't question why, mm -hmm. see? You just do what you're told. So I wasn't there very long. But we used to put stacks of them. I think there were six or eight of them in a the stack. And we'd jam them down into the gun, and they'd, the guy would shoot them, and then we then it'd fly out, and then we'd jam another one in, see? So we'd, uh, we'd, uh, that, that's what we did with them. But their shells probably about, about that long. Mm -hmm. But they're very good at, uh, up close against a plane. They really could shoot them out. Okay, so um, after Midway, where did you go? Where did, was your assignment? After, after, after Midway. We come back into uh, Guadalcanal or into Hawaii, and we went out, uh, refueled and, and re, uh, 
supplied everything, and then we went out and practiced our gunnery practice. It's all we ever did because we always were practice and gunnery practice. See? Mm -hmm. And then we went to uh, uh, went to uh, Esperito Santos down in New Hebrides, mm -hmm. and then we went to uh, uh, New Guinea. Then we went to Tonga Taboo, and uh, in the Tonga Islands. That's it's way south down there, and. Uh, uh, then, then we joined up with, uh, went back and joined the, the crowd, and we all went to Guadalcan Guadalcanal together. Okay. Before so. we get there, did you cross the equator? Oh, yes. <laughs> that was quite, that's the one thing my grandson I just told you about said the first thing. He says, Grandpa, I'm a, I'm a shell back now, I'm not a polywag anymore. <laughs> mm. <laughs> yeah, hey, that's quite the thing to be a, to be a, to be a, uh, Across the equator, because I talked to some people right now that were in the in in for three or four years and they never crossed the equator. Mm -hmm. See, so uh, and the same way as when the, the thing thing I sent you uh, uh, across the international date line. See, I sent you a little card, yes. and uh, you crossed the international date line. Yeah, that's that, Oops, that's the card. If you we, hold it up. Then. That's the card we got for crossing 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 the international date line. See. And, and, and it shows that we belong to the Order of the Golden Dragons. Okay, got it. Okay. Okay, so uh, you went to Guadalcanal. What? Yeah, and uh, we, we patrolled out there all the time. We were well, you said something about artillery for the, music, for the Marines there? Yeah, well, after, after oh, okay. they unloaded, mm -hmm. see? And uh, Japs were still coming in, see, still coming in, and uh, they they were running out of a lot of stuff at Guadalcanal. Mm -hmm. So we were we, we we used to patrol the coast up and down, and where the Marines needed artillery, we'd start oh, shooting. Okay. See, mm -hmm. so uh, we we come under the command of uh, 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 our uh, Ad Admiral. I can't think of his name now. <laughs> it's Admiral Scott. Because I used to play AC Ducey with him on deck. Oh, you did? Oh, yeah. He was a nice guy. He said, leave all the stuff, saluting and everything for people back in the States. He said, we're out here to fight a war. He said, relax. Just don't get sick. They worried about somebody getting sick mm -hmm. for the simple reason they needed three people to take care of them if somebody got sick or got hurt. See? So the stress, cleanliness, and take care of yourself. They didn't care if you did anything, as long as you didn't get hurt. So you're ready to go. So what was it like being on patrol through? Uh, well, we all we did is go. Uh, I don't know where we went. See, we didn't know. We were the least person to know anything mm -hmm. out there. The last person to know. Uh, uh, I was um, after a while. I got into radio, and they said a battle was raging, and they said, Sir, "We said, where is the battle? Where we're in it?" See, he said, "Where is the battle? Battle last. Our battle lasted about well." 15, actually 15 minutes, then they cleaned up afterwards, see. Mm -hmm. I see a couple of Jap ships get sunk because they're, they're crippled the next day and they're afraid they're going to get us, so we had to get them first. Mm -hmm. and now, what, was this Salvo Island? Yeah, off of Salvo Island, yeah. Island. Yeah, yeah and that's, that's where we went down. Uh, we went down, uh, we're, we're, here's the thing. We got hit, uh, there's the article in here. We got hit by at least one torpedo and at least uh, 48 shells. And a lot of them were right from the San Francisco. Put a couple of salvos right through us. I don't know how many hit, but they are in, our uh, gunnery officer. They have markings, I guess, on, on the shells that when they go through, they by a marking, they tell who where it comes from. And they said it come from the one of our own ships that hit us. So... Uh, the big, big thing is uh, we're, we're really, really, when we went up there, we're in general quarters for a couple of days, and we're really scared up there. That's where we're locked in, and we didn't know when they were coming or anything else. See? And you're locked in this little room. You can't open the door without permission from somebody. And uh, here, 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 here they are. You're patrolling out there, and you don't know day or night outside. Except somebody got a wristwatch, Bobby, and you don't see daylight or anything else. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, we were hugging the shore. 
when we got sunk, see, we're hugging the shore. And the only way to see us, Jap battleship come in and start shelling, shelling the place and the flash that's from the gun, they spotted us. So the destroyers come over and uh, turn the searchlights on us. And we're the, I think we're the first ones to fire a shot in that battle for the simple reason when they turned the searchlights on us, our, our, automatically they swung right around and boom, they shot them right out, see. Mm -hmm. And uh, our turret I was in only fired two salvos and they're gone. And then blood come down in the turret and some of the kids start screaming and crying and everything else, see. Scared to death, see. But we didn't know what was going on. The only thing we know, nothing happened. We, they didn't want no more shells, see. So finally, the only way we got out is we asked the doctor. The doctor was operating in the mess hall, see. People were hurt, see. And we asked the doctor if he could come out. He said, come on out, help us, see. Otherwise, we couldn't even open the door. I don't know how many guys got locked in when we went down. If they couldn't get to them, we, we, they just had to go down with the ship. Because the ship was going down. They tried everything they could. And like it says here, we lost over a third of our crew, killed or missing. And that's over 200 men. That was the, the night, those were night battles, wasn't yeah, it? They yeah, yeah, 3 o'clock in the morning. It was 3 o'clock in was the morning. Was that November? November 13th, 1942. 14th, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And uh, the ship was uh, well in December. It would have been have been a year old. It was, it was not even not even eleven months old. Now, did you lose power? Was it your oh, ship, or was it the San Francisco? Oh, no, lost? we lost we lost all our you power all from the power. torpedo. Yeah, we had auxiliary power for one five-inch gun at the at the fan tail, and uh, at the five-inch gun here, one plane start coming over and they start shooting at it by hand, almost, and instead of automatic, everything uh -huh. was being done by hand, and uh, uh, they, they warded it off. Uh -huh. Now, were you ordered to abandon ship? Uh, uh, somebody said there was an order to abandon ship, but I never heard it. Uh -huh. And uh, uh, I'm glad I didn't, because the sharks got a lot of the guys that got in the water. Because uh, uh, somebody started shooting at a Jap when, when I, uh, I happened to see him on deck, and they, he almost got, the guy almost got killed for shooting at him. He said, he's got enough problems. He says, we, don't shoot at him. He said, the sharks will get him before, before he gets to, gets to shore. Mm -hmm. See? So, uh, hey, we're not as cruel as a lot of people say we are. <laughs> So what happened to your ship? You lost well, the after, power? And no, after we lost power, uh, we got out, we got on deck, we were uh, on fire up in the bow. Its bow was going down by the bow, see? And uh, there's a fire up there. They got two little handy billies, which are two-inch hoses. That's all they got to fight the fire with. In the meantime, we're forming a brigade. We're getting, they give us asbestos gloves. We're handling hot shells too hot to handle without the gloves and throwing them over the side, trying to save the ship. But the ship started going down too fast and they were worried about the Japs getting a hold of it. It was drifting towards, towards the beach. So they were worried about the, they dropped an anchor to hold it in place. And uh, the, uh, the whole, they're hold, they're hold, they hold it in place, see. And uh, we're throwing these shells over, and finally, the, uh, finally, the, 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 it still kept going down. The ship kept going down, and there was no, no hope of saving it. And they didn't want to take no chance of the Jap getting it, because we were a brand new ship. We we're ten months old, mm -hmm. see? and it was a brand new ship. So uh, I guess the captain got permission from somebody to. Uh, uh, do what he wanted. Now you had to. a lot of sophisticated radar equipment. Oh yeah, yeah, we had good radar ship. equipment on the ship. Uh -huh. Yeah, we had everything good. We knew the Japs were coming, but they didn't know we were there. Uh -huh. In fact, uh, a battleship opened fire at us at 1,600 yards. That's how close we were, and that's uh -huh. how come I'm still here. They couldn't get down low enough to get uh -huh. me in the upper handling room. See, and, and it made a big difference. Made a big difference. So how did you, how, how did the ship sink? Uh, well, the boats from Guadalcanal come out uh -huh. and got us. And guess what? There's some Marines sitting there checking every boat as it comes in, seeing if I got off. <laughs> I met him, he's from my hometown, uh, Casmer Brown from Stillwater. 
That's about a mile from where I live. I met him down in Brooklyn, too, in the Navy Yard down there, and he knew I was on that ship. And he's behind a 50, 50 caliber machine gun in, in, in a foxhole over there. And boy, he grabbed me and he said, boy, thank God for you guys here. He said, they would have rock walked right over us. He said, we have nothing to stop them. Mm -hmm. See, so uh, uh, that's probably why they're so happy that uh, we were out there, but we lost nine ships. A lot of people went down. A lot of people went down with those ships. In fact, that's where the, the, the Juno went down with the Sullivan brothers. They took us in tow, and they're towing us away from the shore at first. And... Uh, before we, we start sinking too fast, and they let us go and grab the Juno. They took the Juno out, and there's a Jap, the Jap uh, submarine out there. Put a, put a fish in them, and it blew them right up. Do you know how deep the water was that the ship sank in? 400 fathoms, I guess. 400 fathoms. Deep. Yeah, that's what they, uh, that's what the, the reports. See, we don't mm -hmm. know anything. In mm -hmm. fact, I got all the reports from my congressman, mm -hmm. Sweeney. He got everything for me. I told him, I said, someday my grandkids are going to ask me, what did I do in the service? I could tell them, but they said, I want to read it. See? So that's why I got all this here stuff from Sweeney. Sweeney got it all for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So after you uh, went ashore, what, where did you go? In a foxhole. <laughs> <laughs> because some of them ships that were damaged out there, the battleship, there was two battleships in a battle out there. Mm -hmm. Them battleships got damaged. They couldn't go. So they're pumping their shells in anywhere they could shoot. And uh, you, you want to get scared sometimes. Get a 16-inch gun with a shell going over your head. Hear a whistle go by. <laughs> but anyway, the Marines used to run up way deep in the woods. I guess they may have things set. And they used to uh, uh, burn oil cans, you know, have old oil and everything else. They used to light it and burn it and think they're, they're, think they're hitting something. And they'd fire up towards oh, where, where they were hitting something, see. And when they fired more, they'd start more fires up there, see. So, uh, hey, I survived after four days. And then they took us down. They took us down to uh, Numea, down to New Caledonia. Mm -hmm. Put us out in the woods, out in the tents. Nobody even knew where we were. We were down in New Caledonia someplace. We didn't know. Nobody knew. You, you couldn't go anywhere. You couldn't do anything. Just wait. See? And uh, uh, right now I, I think of all these kids in school where they talk about psychiatrists. If you need a psychiatrist, you need them down there. <laughs> see? And uh, not in the schools like they have here. See? And uh, hey, we survived. Some kids, uh, some kids uh, uh, went went batty. A couple of them went batty, but uh, I, I guess they expect that for somebody who's never been away and never uh, been babied. When, mm -hmm. Especially the kids that have been babied all their life is the ones that had a lot of trouble. Mm -hmm. But other other guys got along good. Mm -hmm. Then after three weeks down there suffering. And we all thought we're waiting to go home, see? Go back, get another ship. Mm -hmm. Hey, after three weeks, they said, you're going up in the PT boats. I said, where the heck is that? I said, that's just further up north from where you are now, see? So I go up the PT boats. And uh, we get up there, and it's on Talagi. That's across from Guadalcanal. So we're up there. Every night, wash machine, Charlie would come down and bomb us. Every single night. At least one bomb would drop somewhere, you know, just mm -hmm. to annoy, more annoy us. Mm -hmm. And then we hear Tokyo Rose on the radio telling us everything that's going to happen to us, like this dictator now over here in Saddam telling mm -hmm. everything, you know, how everything is rosy. She mm -hmm. did the same mm -hmm. thing. So uh, uh, we, I was loading. I was seaman. I was loading gasoline in the boat, you know, and everything else. And, all of a sudden, this one day, a guy came up to me and he says, you Steve Dennis? I said, yeah. He said, you're radium in third class today. I said, I don't even know how to turn on the radio. <laughs> he said, you're the only guy in the base who knows how to type. So he said, get going. <laughs> so that's how I become a radio man. Not because I wanted to or anything, because I was forced to. But anyway, I got in the, I got in the, I got in the radio shack and well, I hear all these guys coming in. And... Uh, 
they'd all have to get their reports out before they went out to, on patrol, you know. And uh, first thing you know, after I'm there a while, uh, Wizard White, the Supreme Court Justice, gets a desk next to me. Oh. See? So he sits there and he sends messages, you know, he wants a message to go out to the guys and I'd have to bring it in to the commander, which is Commander Caliber, and uh, he'd say, uh, who wrote this? I said, Mr. White. He said, well, you know what you want to do? Go back and have him tell you what he wants to say, and you say it so them guys out there could understand what he's talking about. Because <laughs> he, he was a Rhodes Scholar. See, he was a Rhodes Scholar. He was the All-American football player from Colorado. So anyway, I, I knew him probably about a month, or maybe two months, till the bomb hit the radio shack. After Bond hit the Radio Shack, I never seen that man again. See, I never see uh, 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 the president either after that. Oh, you saw him prior to that? Oh, yeah, him? oh, yeah. His, his boat was there. He made booze on his boat, he distilled the alcohol and everything else, uh, like everybody else did on the boat. He was a real regular guy. He liked to fool around with... Yeah, we used to, and uh, uh, well, we're up there, and you know how they have, uh, I don't know if you guys were in the service or not, but anyway, they had working parties all the time when you go for supplies. Mm -hmm. So the chief would come around, he says, you, 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 come on with me. We're going to get some stuff now. When I say this, you do this. So he'd say, uh, uh, 10 cases of prune juice, you get grapefruit juice. 10 cases of orange juice, you get, you get grapefruit juice because we had to put the alcohol in it. And that's what kept all the guys calm. In fact, we had one guy that was a first class uh, machinist mate. His job was to uh, just distill the stuff so everybody wouldn't have a still all over the place because everybody had a still on every boat and everything else. Like, and they're afraid well, somebody get hurt. But they had this one guy do it all and they give everybody a little bit. But as long as you, uh, as long as you behaved, you know, and didn't, didn't go out, out, way out, they didn't say anything, but it calmed, I guess it calmed everybody down. But I was so there. What, I was, did you get to, what did you think of Kennedy at all? Did you uh, get you, to know him there? At the time, he was just a regular guy. Mm -hmm. just a guy. Kelly was there. Kelly was the guy that, uh, with, the, with the guy from, coming from the Philippines. He was there, see? And, and uh, him, remember Kelly and Buckley in the Philippines, oh, yes. MacArthur? Mm -hmm. Well, Kelly was there. And he got all the attention, not, not Kennedy. See, Kennedy didn't get no attention until the destroyer run through him. I was on the radio at the time. We just reported him missing. We didn't know if it was to, uh, uh, what, what happened or anything. It's just a normal thing that he didn't, he didn't answer the call or whatever he's supposed to do, you know. He didn't answer, so. What do you think of a, a destroyer going through a PT boat? I think it's his, his fault. You never should for the, for the for the, uh, the way them boats run should have never never have happened. But uh, everybody does something uh, wrong at some time mm -hmm. or another. Did, but, you, uh, did you ever see him after he was rescued? Huh? No, I never seen him after he was rescued. No. And uh, another thing, I see uh, the governor of South Dakota, Joe Foss. Shot down seven planes in seven minutes, right over our heads, really? protecting us. And we used to watch some of them battles in the air, you know, right from where we were. But we had choice seats. <laughs> and uh, they try to get these here uh, wash machine Charlie to come over every night, and they just couldn't get them for some reason or another. We didn't know, they didn't know where he come from. They had P-38s looking for him. They couldn't mm -hmm. find them, see. And a lot of our own boats, uh, uh, I, I was supposed to go out on a boat, and uh, the guys from some guys from the states come in, and they wanted to go on a boat. So I told them, "Go ahead." That's why. I, that's why I was loading gasoline, because I let them guys go on a boat out on patrol. See. So you never were on a PT boat? I was, I was, I was patrol. Not, not on patrol, no, but I was on a PT boat a lot because we went to Guadalcanal a lot, and I rode across mm -hmm. on, uh, on there a lot. We went over for supplies and different things we needed, and I rode it on a lot, but uh, I never went out on patrol for a simple reason. Other guys wanted to go, mm -hmm. and I seen my share of the action. I said, I know what it's, uh, what it's like, see? So I said, hey, 
Maybe that's why I'm still here. But anyway, we, uh, we got so bad over there, guys were trying to get malaria to go home. That's how bad it was in Guadalcanal. And uh, uh, you had scorpions all over the place. I got bit twice by a scorpion. And uh, a guy gave me two shots of morphine and it still didn't calm me down. That's how, that's how tough, the, uh, tough it was. But uh, if you got uh, malaria three times, you automatically get sent home. And uh, you had to take Adabrin when you ate. And uh, the doctor would put it right in your mouth and make sure you took it, see? And then after a while, they start putting it in the food even because the, the guys didn't want to take it, mm -hmm. see? But uh, uh, hey, I didn't care one way or another one about, about it. I says, hey, if I'm going to get it, I'll get it. If I ain't going to get it, uh, all right, see? But uh, I was in there almost, what, almost two years in, in PT boats right after that. And uh, then, then I got uh, transferred back to the States. I got into Treasure Island, or the, yeah, I could give you my pass, see? Oh, I yes, showed you the okay. pass from Treasure Island, see? This is a pass from, this is a Liberty Pass from Treasure Island. We kept it. It was a... Perpetual Liberty Pass. All we had to do is beat it for muster at nine o'clock in the morning, and they'd be they'd be all set. See, mm -hmm. so uh, uh, we get into uh, Treasure uh, Treasure Island, and uh, we go to 101 Market Street. There's barracks right on 101 Market Street. We laid there. I had a bed right near the window. I looked right out the window, right out of my bed, and we hung around there just in. Just didn't do nothing, wait. To, uh, and then all, all of a sudden they told us you had to go. They're, they transferred us over to our Norfolk, Virginia. We're going to go get a ship that's being built up in Maine, the USS Shannon. It's a destroyer. And uh, in the meantime, I got a slip for all my clothes that I lost when the ship went down. So, so somebody stole my wallet with the slip in it. I didn't have no clothes. I couldn't go anywhere because I didn't have no clothes. When I got to Norfolk, Virginia. I went to everybody to see it, and only the Salvation Army would help me. I went, I begged the Red Cross. I said, let me take $100. I said, I got it on the books. I'll give you my number. You take it off, anything. Else. They wouldn't give me nothing. Hmm. Salvation Army, the only one give me enough to let me out to go to uh, uh, get enough clothes so I could get transferred back to the ship that I was supposed to go on. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I would have been stuck right in the place. Like. So anyway, we get, uh, uh, when I get there, we get, uh, uh, I get uh, my cl enough clothes to go up, then we get transferred up to the Shannon up in, up in Augusta, Maine. I'm pretty sure it's Augusta, Maine. And uh, we went aboard the Shannon which was a destroyer. So they made a destroyer mine layer out of it. So were you a, what they call a plank owner at that time? Uh, uh, no, no, uh, it was already commissioned. Okay. It's already commissioned and we got on the ship just like we did on the Atlanta. See, somebody was already there and we just come to fill in. So I get on the ship and they tell me, go copy code. I said, I don't know no code. <laughs> And so I says, uh, they said, what do you mean you don't know? How'd you get the rate? I said, they give it to me. <laughs> so I got into voice communication after that. They needed voice communication, so I got into voice communication after that. So uh, I broke code. Uh, when uh, out for secret message had come for the captain, he'd give me the code. I'd go in the room, I'd break it down. Him and I are the only one who would know, know what's going on in the... In the uh, in the message, see, after he got the message, he'd either tear it up or, if it's really important, he'd tear it up so nobody else would see it. See, mm -hmm. and uh, I learned not to say anything. See, I didn't know nothing. I didn't know nobody's last name or anything else. They said, well, uh, they said, learn to forget in case anything happens, you could forget. See, but uh, anyway, we on that Shannon. We come over, we come to back down to Norfolk, and then we went to uh, Bermuda. We went to Bermuda, 
and uh, we uh, uh, shakedown crews. You know, mm -hmm. it was. And when they got the mines on, we spent six weeks off of Cape Hatteras looking for a storm, and we couldn't find one. <laughs> and that's the stormiest place around, <laughs> anywhere you go. But there's never one big enough. So anyway, I got sick after that. I got tonsils. My tonsil. I had tonsils yet, and they. They, I don't know if they got infected somehow or not, but when we got to, started going overseas, back over the Pacific, and they stopped at Charleston, South Carolina, I got dumped into the hospital. So when they took out my tonsils, I couldn't get back on a ship in time, so I was in that hospital three weeks with infected uh, th uh, throat, see. And uh, after that, I think a ship come over from Europe, the, the ANCON, that's how I got aboard the ANCON. They put me aboard the ANCON, which was a communication ship. So I went back overseas again on the, on the ANCON. And we ended up in Subic Bay in, in the Philippines. So we, we stood in the Subic Bay. We're, 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 a command, we're actually a command ship. We're planning the uh, invasion of uh, Okinawa off the ship because our ship, we made all the maps and everything else for all, all the other ships and all the, uh, everything that they needed, we made aboard the ship. And we had reporters on the ship. All, uh, that, that, that's where our ship was. In fact, when we got up to the, sign the peace treaty, we had a lot, about 100 something reporters on the ship. But anyway, we went to Okinawa. There we, we invaded Okinawa and we were the command ship. We had, I think, Admiral Spruance on, on, I don't remember exactly which one, but we had Admiral Spruance on board. But anyway, I was in charge of uh, voice communication for the Admiral on the ship. And uh, here are all these action going around all, all over the place. And all the officers would come in and pick up the phone and say something, lay down the phone, the guy stayed there and nobody knew what he said and what he was doing or anything else, see? And you can't, can't say nothing to an officer. So the commander, he was a big guy, he come in, he was on the admiral's staff, he says, what's going on? I told him, I says, officers? I said, I can't say boo to an officer. Mm -hmm. I says, I don't care what it is, I don't care what they do. I can't stop them. I could tell the men what to do, but I can't tell the officer what to do. See? So he sat there a while and he seen what they were doing. He said, what do you have to do to straighten it out? So I says, put a sign on that door. Nobody comes in here without my permission or whoever's in charge. See, at the radio shack at the time. Wow, he said, three days he come down. He said, the Admiral's big grin on his face. And he said, he had a big grin. The Admiral wasn't hollering at him anymore, see. He said, what did you do? I said, nothing. I did, I did what I was supposed to do. Get the reports from all these people who are running out of fuel and out of food and out of ammunition and everything else. See, all the ones that were doing it. And then the kamikaze come. Kamikazes guys start hitting us and we're, we're, we're uh, an old uh, presidential line ship. Mm -hmm. In fact, here's a picture of it. This is the Shannon, right here. Here's okay, the, why you hold it up to here, the This is the Shannon here. Okay, got it. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'll see if I can find the Anton here now. This is the AMCON. This is the communication ship that we where I was on when we invaded Okinawa. Okay. Okay? Yep. And then after that, after the invasion of Okinawa, we come back and we back in Subic Bay. Now were you uh, attacked at all by kamikazes? Were uh, you under any attack? They, they, we we surrounded, we're, we're a command ship, we mm -hmm. surrounded ourselves with every, all, everything so they'd get everybody before they got us, mm -hmm. see. So uh, we're pretty, pretty safe and uh, uh, none even come close to us, mm -hmm. see. 
Did you they, ever see a ship get hit with uh, Kamikaze? No, no, never seen a ship get hit. I seen the ship get sunk at Guadalcanal. I seen a couple of them get sunk by the Portland shooting and uh, finishing off uh, some of the destroyers that were damaged over there. But I, that's the only time I've ever seen a, fi a ship get sunk. But anyway, we come back to uh, Subic Bay, and that was Easter Sunday that we invaded uh, Okinawa. Mm -hmm. And this was around June or July, and everything stopped on a ship. Nobody was doing nothing. Everybody wonder what's going on. See, when they stopped making map, they're making all the maps to invade Japan. See, getting everything ready to invade Japan, and all of a sudden, all of a sudden, we hear the atomic bombs went off. See, and uh, well, they, then we, then we knew why everybody stopped, because uh, the guys on the ship says even that uh, they would never invade Japan for a simple reason that they didn't want to shoot the women and kids. That's all was left in Japan. What was your reaction when you heard about the atomic bombs? Uh, we're surprised. We're surprised. See? And uh, uh, most of us were anyway. And uh, none of us knew uh, we had an atomic bomb that we could drop over mm -hmm. there. We heard them over, over in uh, uh, the States and uh, the West Coast. They're dropping them out there. But uh, in, in Nevada, they were dropping them, but we never thought they had one over there. Mm -hmm. So, uh, hey, we said it's a good thing. It saved a lot of lives. It saved a lot. But they estimated a million lives are saved by just dropping the atomic bomb. Mm -hmm. So that just, uh, that reminds me of right now over there. We lost maybe 100, 200 lives. But just imagine if he got his hands on all that stuff over in uh, Iraq, what, what mm -hmm. he would be doing. Yeah. So it was it was a good thing, and then instead of making the maps, we went uh, via Iwo Jima. We seen Iwo Jima on our way to Tokyo to sign the peace treaty, and we anchored right next to the uh, Missouri. In fact, I had a better better view than most because I was on a bridge. I was looking down off the bridge. I was looking down at them signing. Uh, signed in the peace treaty. I heard, see, I heard General MacArthur talking and everything else. You could hear him almost as plain as day. But uh, one thing I never seen uh, in pictures was just soon as Wainwright signed a plane was overhead, and it was just like a, a, a hive of bees coming over. All, every plane in the area was coming right over. Mm -hmm. And when that first plane was right overhead, that's when Wainwright starts signing that peace treaty. See? And I never seen a picture of it until Mr. Sullivan, the one that did everything in mechanical, oh, all yes. the people, the handicapped person, mm -hmm. he got a picture of it for me to, mm -hmm. to show me what it looked like. I said, I seen the plane. I said, I know it's out there, but I never seen it in anywhere. Hmm. Right. So, uh, so anyway, after that, after they signed the peace treaty, I was on a teletype. I sent all all the reporters. Uh, they give me the order to put the stuff on my on, on the desk there and put uh, in what order, and I type it all out on the tape and send it all back via. Guam to San Francisco and all the UP and AP and uh, Associated Press and uh, the writers, writers or over in uh, England and everything else. They all got it on, on, on all on the tape. Hmm. So uh, we had a lot of reporters on the ship, and uh, uh, they all wanted this stuff to go, but I had to take it in order with the, my commanding officer who would tell me what to do. But then right after that, uh, we had so many points that they got us right off the ship, shipped us to Guam and sent us home. We signed the peace treaty on September 2nd. I didn't get home until November the, November the 25th. See? <laughs> See? So that's how long it took me to get back. I got over there quick, but I could, it took a long time to get back. <laughs> how did you get back? Well, they shipped us down to Guam, and we stayed there a while. And then they shipped us to San Francisco, and we stayed there a while. Then they got put through us on a troop train with a bunch of army guys, and we come across country on a troop train. In fact, the train broke down in Salt Lake City, and uh, we run out of food by the time we got to Chicago, and uh, we ended up in Lido Beach down in New York, and I got discharged. 
Did you ever, uh, when you returned, did you ever make use of the GI Bill? Uh, no, no. Never, never, never. I wanted to go to college, like yes, I told I you. One, once I couldn't go to college, I didn't want nothing. Because uh -huh. I, I, I was always, I went and got married instead. And then uh, when you get married, you had to get a job. And uh, you're just hustling all the time you, to get everything that you wanted. You know, you're starting a home and everything else. Uh -huh. And once I started that, if I had a chance, I would have used it to, to go. But Did you ever use that 5220 club? No. No. no I, never, I went right to work. Mm -hmm. I went right to work. I had a job waiting for me. What did you do? Uh, electrician. Okay, yes. You yeah, said I you told you. Yeah, they, yeah, okay. they had to take mm -hmm. me back, see? Mm -hmm. So they took me back. And, but one thing is, when I was, I, used, I was a Republican committee man, and they wanted to make me a, a trustee at Syracuse University. At the College of Forestry, see. Really? Well, I was a union officer, and I was a, 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 a Republican, which was odd, you know, to be Republican and a union officer, see. But anyway, I, I, well, when you got three kids, you can't visualize what could happen mm -hmm. to you, see. And and the company didn't like me because I was a union officer, see. And I told I told the guy I said, "Hey, I got three kids to think about." I said, "I'd like I'd love to have went out there." I said, "But if I start taking too much time off, I'm liable to get fired because mm -hmm. they don't want me there." So. Do you want to have him hold that yes. photograph up? Yes. Could you tell us when that was taken? This was taken in in 1940, about 1943. Okay. Can you hold that closer to you? All right. I'm getting a lot of glare off of it, that's why. Okay. Did you join any veterans organizations? Yes. I joined the American Legion first, in fact, down in Mechanicville, and what we call Riverside now. Uh -huh. I, I got the first load of wood and everything else to help build that Legion Hall down there. Did you? Okay. okay. Yeah. But uh, when these people here in North, uh, North Korea, when this ship surrendered up there, Okay. To the North Koreans, I don't, I forgot the name Pueblo. of the Pueblo. Pueblo, yeah. When they uh, surrendered, and then they're honored by the, by the, by the American Legion, I quit them. Mm -hmm. I walked right away from the American Legion. I joined the VFW, and I've been in there ever since. Mm -hmm. so, Did you ever stay in contact with anyone that you were in the service no, with? Not, uh, they had loads of reunions and everything else. And uh, here, I, I wake up at night. My wife says. I'm screaming and kicking her. All she has to do is say everything's all right, hits me and say everything's all right, and I go back to sleep. I've been doing that for over 60 years now, see. And uh, I didn't want to go and, uh, it's, when you go back, you're talking about everybody that's dead, mm -hmm. see. And, and, I, I, and, and it gets to me after a while when you start talking about dead, see. And so uh, uh, that's why I didn't go to, and I said my wife was never, not one to want to go to all these places. Mm -hmm. see. I would have went, but uh, there even had one in England, had one in Hawaii, you know, on the Ancon especially, they had one. But the other one didn't have, uh, the Atlanta didn't have enough people to have a reunion. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, in fact, they had one here in Albany, and I didn't go because my son, my brother-in-law, had cancer. I had to keep taking him for treatments all the time. See, mm -hmm. and right at that time, a guy from around Boston called me, asked me, uh, wanted to talk to me, and I wasn't home at the time. And my, he, he, he asked me how I was. You know, he says he's busy. He said his brother-in-law has cancer. He's taking him to the hospital all the time. He ain't got time to come anywhere, go anywhere. See, so. Everything happened just that timing was wrong, mm -hmm. and, and, and so many things in my life, it wasn't even funny. But I must be doing something right. I'm 80, 80 years old now, and I'm still here. <laughs> How do you think your time in the service affected your life? Oh, way different. I, completely different attitude after I got walked off of that ship without a scratch. Nothing was ever going to happen to me. I'm not even going to die anymore, see? <laughs> because the guy didn't want me there. That, that was the time to take me, because he took a lot of people there. Mm -hmm. And uh, I must have been doing something right, because he didn't want I'm here. Okay, well, thank you very much.
Uh, how was it? That was very good. Very good. Yeah. Very good.